Hi folks, thanks for tuning in. Three questions have occupied much of the philosophical literature on cinematic horror. What is it? How is it able to frighten and disgust? And why do we seek it out if horror is a, an unpleasant experience? Although there are other issues, this clip will focus on these three questions since they motivate the majority of philosophical writing on cinematic horror. My principal resource for this clip comes from an article by Aaron Smuts uh, titled Horror, which features in the Routledge Companion to Philosophy and Film. As ever, I'll leave a link in the description below. Let's begin by asking ourselves what horror movies actually are. While it may seem like a fool's errand to attempt to come up with a definitive definition of any genre, not least one as varied as horror, efforts to define this type of movie have still been productive. The philosopher Noel Carroll offers a definition that has been the subject of ongoing controversy. Carroll's definition, roughly, is that a work should be classified as horror if it uh, attempts to arouse fear and disgust directed at a monster, which he defines as a threatening creature not thought to exist by current science. It is important to note that Carroll's definition is centred on monsters. It is not enough for a work to merely arouse fear and disgust, as many slasher movies do. The fear and disgust must be directed specifically at a monster of some kind. To count as a horror monster according to Carroll's definition, the creature must be something that does not exist according to contemporary science. To clarify, this would be contemporary science in the world of the fiction, which is typically the same as, or perhaps more developed than the science of uh, the real world. Alien, for example, is set in the future, but even though the scientific world of the movie is more advanced than our own, the xenomorph is still not recognised by the scientific field of its time because it has not been encountered before. The central controversy around this characterization of monsters is that it is too restrictive, though Carol addresses this directly. Psychopaths like Norman Bates in Psycho or Mark Lewis in Peeping Tom certainly are acknowledged by science. Uh, they're not supernatural in any way, so they do not count as monsters in the strict sense. In this respect, Psycho and Peeping Tom do not constitute horror movies according to Carol's definition. Carol raises both uh, these two characters as potential objections to his definition. In reply, he argues that Norman Bates is the exception that proves the rule. Uh, we're tempted to count him as a monster since he shares so many attributes with genuine monsters, but he is not technically a monster. However, not everyone has been satisfied with the results. Psycho still does not count as horror, according to Carol's definition. We might say that it's not necessary to come up with a formal definition of horror and can instead work with the looser notion that horror features monsters that are not beyond the science, but are simply evil. However, while Psycho would now count as a horror movie, so would uh, Joe Pesci's gangster Tommy in Goodfellas, or your average movie villain also counts as a monster since they're evil. The trouble is, by any common sense definition, Gangster or action movies do not qualify as horror movies. Hannibal Lecter could be described as an evil monster, albeit still a human being like Norman Bates. Um, and he's in a horror movie. Freddy Krueger is an evil monster, not recognised by science, and he is also in a horror movie. But Skeletor, Voldemort, Thanos and the Wicked Witch of the West are not in horror movies, even though they could all be described as evil monsters not recognised by science. However, if we go with Carol's definition that horror is a movie which features a monster that is not recognised by the scientific realm of the story world, we can say that this definition is acceptable but somewhat stipulative. In other words, it works in a sense but it doesn't always fit with the concept of horror movie as most of us think of it. We could say that Carol has offered a definition of the most typical kind of horror since there are so many important horror movies that fit this definition. Examples include Dracula, Frankenstein, Dawn of the Dead, Suspiria, The Exorcist, Alien, 
An American Werewolf in London, The Thing, Evil Dead, The Fly, Nightmare on Elm Street, Hellraiser, The Blair Witch Project, The Ring, Cloverfield. The list goes on. All of these movies feature a monster uh, that's threatening and is not recognised by science. However, even though there are exceptions to this definition, having it has allowed Carroll to develop a theory of the appeal of horror, classify various uh, common plot structures and explain why this type of horror film is so effective. With that in mind then, we can ask ourselves why vampires, werewolves, zombies and other horror monsters are frightening for audiences, even though we don't actually believe in their existence. To appreciate the answers to this question, we must first look closely at a related puzzle. How a horror movie is able to horrify when we're perfectly aware that what we are watching is fiction. There's two different ways of going about this. Uh, according to one system of thought, the illusion theorists suggest that in order to respond emotionally to a fictional story, there needs to be a small measure of belief in that story, just a little bit, just enough for us to react emotionally. By contrast, Noel Carroll suggests that we can entertain thoughts in our head we don't actually believe, but they still have an emotional effect on us. All you have to do is imagine the death of someone you love. Uh, if you take a moment to dwell on the thought that a serial killer kidnapped a close friend, tied them up and decapitated them, you're likely to be emotionally affected by that thought, by the little narrative in your head. Uh, perhaps your muscles would tighten up a little bit and you might feel a pang of anger or anxiety. By the same token, we get imaginatively involved with fictions that other people created, not just the ones that we imagine in our heads. Aaron Smuts, if you remember whose article this clip is based on, also points out that uh, when we're very young, we learn about fictional creatures. So just as small children usually believe in Santa Claus, they also hear stories about witches, demons, ghosts, evil spirits, vampires, Frankenstein, and so on. And on some level, they believe in them too, just as they believe in uh, bats and rats and snakes. Although we eventually grow out of believing in supernatural creatures, the argument goes, we do still harbour a quiet partial belief in the supernatural. Even if we don't consciously believe in ghosts or evil spirits anymore because we're irrational adults, some parts of us still quietly does because we grew up believing in those things. Simply put, it's not easy to shake off the kinds of beliefs that many of us develop as children. And the reason it's hard to shake off superstitious beliefs is because it's much harder to convince a person that something doesn't exist than it is to convince them that something does exist. Beliefs that things do not exist are easily corrected. All we have to do is see the thing. So I might not believe in flying pigs, but show me one and I'll believe in flying pigs. However, beliefs that things do not exist are much harder to vanquish. If I already believed in flying pigs and you told me they didn't exist, uh, you'd have a difficult time convincing me that they don't. We'd have to travel the entire world uh, before I believed you. What this has to do with horror movies is that many horror fictions enact a belief revival process through the presence of a sceptical character. As Noel Carroll has identified, one common horror plot structure involves the discovery and confirmation of the existence of a monster prior to its confrontation. So typically a sceptical character, often a scientist, will belittle accounts of the monster. Not only does the sceptic end up converted, but he or she is often the first one to die as they're the least prepared to deal with a genuine threat. That's what happens in the um, Alien movies, for example. Ripley tries to warn everybody that the xenomorph is dangerous and no one believes her, and they all end up getting killed, and she survives, usually. Uh, the two journalists in the uh, 2018 version of the movie Halloween just see Michael Myers as a deranged man, not an indestructible supernatural entity. You can guess what happens to them early on in the film. For the rest of this clip then, I want to talk about something called the paradox of horror. Traditionally, the question of why people seek out the experience of putatively painful art has been presented as the paradox of tragedy. 
And recently, Carol has introduced a related problem known as the paradox of horror. We may ask, why do people want to watch horror films or tragedies when they make us feel bad? Particularly since we avoid situations in real life that arouse the same emotions. The paradox, then, is how audiences seem to feel pleasure while watching horror movies. Do we like feeling bad? Not in real life. If we do not assume that people derive pleasure from tragedy, or that pleasure must be uh, the sole motive for engaging with art, the paradox of horror can be given a more general form that we can call the paradox of painful art. The paradox of painful art can be stated as follows. 1. People do not typically seek out situations that arouse painful emotions. 2. People have painful emotions in response to some art. 3. People routinely seek out arts that they know will arouse painful emotions. If you think about it, pretty much any narrative that you encounter is going to have a negative emotion at some point. That's where conflict arises from. Horror movies and tragedies as well, you could think of as uh, more of an extreme case. Since horror arouses fear and disgust, two reactions that are typically aversive, it maps neatly onto the paradox of painful art. To clarify the various debates on the topic, it must be noted that there are two related questions that need to be answered. First, why is it that people seek out putatively painful art in general? And second, why do people want to experience horror fiction in particular? As to the first question, which looks at painful art in general, there are numerous competing accounts of how the paradox of painful art might be resolved. Control theorists argue that the putative painfulness of some artworks is mitigated, that's to say, made easier to cope with, by our ability to stop experiencing them at will. So any moment you like, you can turn the TV off, you can leave the movie theatre, what have you. Compensation theorists argue that any painful reactions must be compensated for by other pleasures or values. Uh, this can be in two different ways, either in the craft of the narrative, so that's to say the horror is unpleasant but the film is well made, so we can still admire the way that it was made. Or we might be compensated in the fact that we're made aware again that we're sympathetic creatures, responsive to suffering of others. So that's to say we see other people suffering, we feel bad about it, and then we feel good about ourselves for feeling bad for them. Another theory is the conversion theorists, who argue that the overall experience of painful artworks is not one of pain, but of pleasure, as the emotional pain is converted into a larger, more pleasurable experience. Power theorists argue that we enjoy the feeling of power that arises from the overcoming of our fears. We feel powerful for having survived the frightening experience of the movie. Rich experience theorists argue that there are many reasons why people do things other than to feel pleasure. The overall experience of painful art may be unpleasant, but the experience can still be seen as valuable and as such we're motivated to, to do it. These theories all account for painful art in general rather than horror specifically. For a more horror specific answer, Noel Carroll presents a compensatory theory arguing that the reason why audiences seek out horror fictions, knowing full well that they will experience fear and disgust, is for the compensatory psychological pleasures. Audiences, on Carol's account, enjoy thinking about how one should go about confronting monsters. The experience of horror is the price we're willing to pay for the pleasures of discovery. Another issue we can grapple with, uh, which this theory doesn't account for, however, is identification with the monsters themselves. Theorist Daniel Shaw argues that horror fictions are often enjoyable because they allow audiences to identify both with a monster as it dispatches the more annoying teenagers, but also with the heroes who usually survive. Audiences can, however, sympathize with or admire the monster such as Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs, whose cunning and wit bring him into sympathy with the audience. Uh, that particular film may be an exceptional case, but it's a productive insight.
In one of the more popular accounts of the appeal of horror, the writer H.P. Lovecraft argues that people enjoy horror because it allows them to combat scientific materialism and to engage in feelings of cosmic awe. That's to say, horror provides something of a religious experience that helps alleviate the deadening effects of living in a sanitized, science-based culture. The feeling of awe or wonder compensates for whatever negative reactions one might experience while fearing the unknown. This is an appealing theory, I think, the idea that uh, people still have a sense of awe and wonder, even if the world is sort of being uh, rationalised through science. Okay, so that's it for this week. Uh, just to briefly recap then, we've looked at how one goes about defining horror movies, how supernatural creatures still have the power to frighten rational adults, and we've looked at the paradox of painful art. I hope you found this enlightening. Thanks for watching then. As ever, feel free to like, comment and subscribe. I'll explain. Uh, the end of the summer break has finally come around this year and I think this will have to be the last video uh, that I get to make for a while. It's a shame because there's so much more to do and I really enjoy putting them together. Uh, but I wanted to send a big thank you to everyone who supported this project by watching the channel, leaving likes and making nice comments. It's been a really cool experience and uh, supportive words really meant a lot, so, so thank you. Um, I'll make more clips in due course then. Do stay tuned if you're interested in seeing them and feel free to take a look at my previous clips if you haven't seen them all yet. But until then, bye for now.